Welcome to the NIH SPARC program Fireside Chats. In this video, you will hear from SPARC researchers and their peers about their latest discoveries from the bench to the bedside and the exciting potential of bioelectronic medicine to improve health. Hi, I'm Tim Brents at the University of Michigan, and I'm excited to be joined today by Dr. Paul Yu at the University of Toronto. Uh, and we're gonna talk about his research and relevance to the NIH SPARC program. So Paul, can you introduce yourself? Great talking to you again. Um, and it's a pleasure to, to be with you for this interview. I am at the University of Toronto. Um, I'm with the Institute of Biomedical Engineering, and I also have a cross appointment in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering. My title here is Associate Professor in Biomedical Engineering, and I also serve as the Associate Chair for Professional Programs here in, here in the department. Before jumping into your lab, can you tell me a little bit about your background? What's your area of expertise? My background is basically in biomedical engineering. In 2012, I started my lab here at the University of Toronto. And that's when we started looking into peripheral nerve stimulation for modulating bladder function. And in particular, we were interested in um, tibial nerve stimulation. Because at, the, at that time, there wasn't a lot of commercialization. There was uroplasty and whatnot, but there, there wasn't a lot of understanding of how PTN, that's percutaneous um, tibial nerve stimulation, works in patients, let alone tibial nerve stimulation works in animal models. And so that's where we started. So now that you're working on tibial nerve stimulation in your lab, kind of which directions are you taking that? We used a, a, a different model. So the, the, the approach was a bit different in the sense that instead of looking at just the bladder or just the sphincter, we, I guess we looked at it from a holistic point of view. We, we, we had a system, a model where the bladder continuously filled and emptied so that you get this periodic bladder activity. And we sought to look at how tibial nerve stimulation could affect this ongoing steady state of bladder or urinary function. And so with tibial nerve stimulation, we could confirm, as with other studies, that stimulation could inhibit bladder function. But what was interesting is that the amplitudes at which we could achieve this surprisingly higher. And that's when I started thinking of perhaps the saphenous nerve maybe has some effect. We developed a very simplistic lower leg model. And what we found was that you get some activation, co-activation of saphenous nerve fibers. Obviously it doesn't prove anything, right? It just shows that you get some significant spillover. That sort of gave me confidence at least that maybe saphenous nerve activation might might do something. Since we used a computational model to study it further, it suggested that there may be another source as well into this. So that leads into your continuing work in saphenous nerve stimulation. Right. And so then what we did was we we did tibial nerve stimulation and then instead of stimulating the tibial nerve with a nerve cuff, we stimulated the saphenous nerve. And what we found was that we could achieve basically the same inhibitory effects of tibial nerve stimulation. The main difference being that the amplitude of saphenous nerve stimulation was significantly lower. And we collaborated with Dr. Scott McDermott, who is a world-renowned urologist in this field of neuromodulation. What we did was we designed a study that was basically mirrored, that mirrored the PTNS therapy. We did a study where we recruited 18 patients, 16 of whom um, completed the 12-week study and they received percutaneous saphenous nerve stimulation. Basically what we were able to show was that this repeated stimulation was, was successful in improving the symptoms of these patients. And so we saw significant improvements in urge incontinence episodes, improvements in um, the overactive bladder, I think it's the health questionnaire. So it's the subjective measures of improvement. So, so we're, we're currently looking at multiple facets of this, looking to commercialize saphenous nerve stimulation for treating patients with overactive bladder. Yeah, and that, that, that's really exciting. So all from basic science animal observations, some computational modeling, continuing with animal studies, clinical studies, and now you've got a company started and you're working to further translate this in the clinic. I mean, that's, that, that's fantastic. That, that's really exciting. I, I hope that it continues to go well. So I'm, I'm fortunate to have a Spark funded project that is doing some patient specific computational modeling to guide how we do future stimulation approaches. So your work in doing computational modeling, it helped inform your stimulation trials. Do you have any insights or uh, suggestions for how researchers may take into account computational models to develop their own therapies or develop their own research approach? 
computational modeling, I always find it, it, it's, very, it's very challenging. We're always striving to create the best model possible. You're always torn between how much does a model really tell you. And I think there's great value in modeling as long as the question is very specific. I first became familiar with the program when I was at a SFN conference, I believe it was a few years ago. You know, absolutely fabulous idea. The Spark program really is the like the evolution, how, how it fits perfectly with how this field has matured. Right? It's the idea of mapping out the nerve nervous system, all the organs, and trying to develop tools, the network of researchers who could come together and really make a difference in pushing this field forward. It's something that has great potential. The timing couldn't be better in terms of putting this program together. With regards to its relevance to my work, I think you agree as well. I, I think my research fits very well with the program. Who knows what can happen in the future? Considering what the SPARK program is bringing together as far as data sets from researchers and, and different modeling aspects as well as different data sets are being compiled together within the program. Do you think there are parts to it that may be beneficial to your future research? I think absolutely yes. And it's not just a spatial aspect of it. There's also a temporal aspect of it as well. If we were to try to test all those parameters in animal studies, we would be, you and I would be both retired and still wouldn't be able to scratch the surface. It's exciting that putting something together like this, right, with, with different components of a larger computational model, I think it, it, it's really exciting. And so what do you wish you knew about neuromodulation 10 years ago? Well, I, I can tell you what I've recently experienced is that I wish, at least for our training programs, that we had some more experience or more courses in commercialization. It wasn't clear when I was doing my PhD or postdoc that things could get commercialized. There's a lot that researchers and um, companies have shown us in the past 10 to 15 years that has really helped us better understand what works and what doesn't work, um, what could be commercialized and what can't be. And e even the, the, the regulatory pathways, we start, we're seeing things change. The way that the FDA is thinking of implantable devices and medical therapies based on neuromodulation, the, the thinking is changing. It's a different ballgame than it was 10 years ago. Uh, I really enjoyed this conversation with uh, Dr. Paul Yu. So thank you very much, Paul, for joining us. And uh, really excited about your re hearing about your research and seeing how it continues in the future. Definitely congratulations on starting your company. And I hope it continues to go well. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. It was, it was my pleasure. We are glad you could join us for this SPARK program fireside chat. For more information on the NIH Common Fund SPARK program, please visit our website at commonfund.nih.gov spark. Thank you for watching and keep up to date with the latest news by following our YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter accounts. See the video description for account details.